By now you should know that there are some things in life I can't stand. I use the word hate very liberally, in most cases it's justified too. I can't begin to describe to you how much I do not like the sea. There isn't a word in any language for it. It isn't like the land, who gives you a fighting chance, or the incorporeal world, that allows you to at least descend almost instantly into madness, or even hell itself, where you know for sure that you are totally screwed. Even with all of the demented creatures that haunt its depths, the sea is perfectly impartial. It cares not for who or what you are. Whenever you step into the territory of the sea, know this. The sea is your mistress. Whether you be a seasoned captain or a curious mind trying to voyage for the first time. Agent Echo, 1643 EST, Atlantic Ocean. Publicly, there is only one operational permanent underwater research facility on the planet. Aquarius Reef Base. Obviously, I'm not going there. Privately, there are a dozen or so of these facilities and most are owned by the United States. As the world's a superpower, we like to throw money we don't have at things that we may not necessarily need. Some of our best findings about the ocean have come from these facilities, and some of our worst nightmares as well. This wouldn't be much of a story if I were dealing with the former, right? Sometimes, my job really sucks. Give me haunted houses, forests, demons, what have you. But I am a land-based girl through and through. The PSV, the platform supply vessel that I was on, bucked and heaved in the swells of the Atlantic. The sun was still out, but the sky was a dingy gray, completely overcast and making the normally bluish ocean water a dark, opaque color. White caps broke against the side of the ship, sending sea spray over the railing and onto the deck, making everything slippery even with the anti-skid paint coating that it had on it. To say I don't have my sea legs is an understatement. I suck at sea. I clung to the railing on the starboard bow, leaning my head over and waiting for the next dry heave. I had already chucked up my guts earlier in the trip and... I'd already maxed out my allowable doses of Dramamine. I sure as heck looked terrible. The crew's earlier laughter at my seasickness had faded to one of concern, with a random crewman wandering up to give me a bottle of water to replenish my fluids. They probably had it on a duty cycle at this point. Hey, whose turn is it to give Echo water? I managed to get my nausea under control for the time being and flip myself around to lean against the railing eyes lifting so I could survey the ship itself. The PSV Lennox looked like a civilian vessel for the most part. Close to 100 meters in length, the hull was a solid black, with the accommodation, pretty much the living space of a ship, painted a contrasting white. The accommodation sat mostly on the foredeck of the ship close to the front, making a small forecastle while maximizing room on the foredeck and the poop deck for supplies and room for research. Underneath the skin, the PSV was certainly not civilian. What, you thought the US Navy only had big gray ships emblazoned with their logo? Come on now. Even the Navy has some secret squirrel stuff. The Lennox was better equipped than many destroyers as far as tech went. That was the whole deal of this operation. DARPA isn't the only defense research component of the United States, and I wasn't the only agency represented. The ship-wide intercom sounded out over the waves. All agency personnel report to the briefing room. The message repeated, and I peeled myself off the railing to stagger inside. The briefing room was a decent size, with a projector screen on the back wall that took up much of the surface. The projector itself was hanging from the ceiling, and it hummed softly as it awaited use. A large desk in the shape of a steep oval with the ends cut off sat central, with multiple plush swivel chairs surrounding it. I wasn't the first to enter, nor was I the last. Like everyone else, my ID card sat in a holder attached to a lanyard around my neck, one that the boss had made up for me last minute since my agency didn't use a common access card like the rest of the DoD. 
I sat in the middle on the right side, taking up little space and flanked by members of other agencies. The room was filled with muted conversation, people who knew each other obviously. I stayed silent. All in all, I saw suits mostly, with two men in OCP uniforms standing against the back wall, uniform sanitized. It's easy to pick out tier 1 guys in uniform, they hate wearing them for the most part. A man stood up at the front wearing a US Navy uniform, but also without insignia or name. He was tall with short cropped salt and pepper hair and a weathered but still handsome face. Green eyes peeped out from a constantly darkened brow, the kind that didn't exactly care for BS. I liked him already. Take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. His gravel-infused voice brought the room to a quiet standstill. My name is Captain Jensen. Let's get this started. The lights dimmed, allowing the projector to show up against the screen. We will be arriving on station in approximately one hour. Backstory as much as I can tell you is that one of our subsurface Atlantic research stations had started sending strange messages through encrypted channels. Our replies to these messages have been disregarded, with no true sitrep regarding the status of the experiments or the personnel within. So, following protocol, we are sending the QRF in with a few guys. Sam, your squad will take Agent Twombly. He paused, allowing for Twombly, a guy with shaggy dark hair and a meek demeanor to raise his hand. Your resident IT guy, and to move through Airlock Alpha once we dock. From there, sweep through the living quarters and up to the admin offices. If everything looks fine and personnel are accounted for, then start ascertaining the source of these strange transmissions. Sam, one of the OCP-clad men, a short man with long brown hair and a thick beard, nodded slowly. Jensen continued. Neem, your squad will take agent... Echo. He looked at me as I raised my hand, cocking a brow to say, really? And then continued, through airlock Bravo, move through the research lab into the subdock. While Sam and his guys check on the people, you'll be seeing that the lab and everything in it are kosher. Either way, make contact with the head researcher, Dr. Alyssa Lind. If there is anything wrong, she can tell you what is happening. He paused and scanned the room. Questions? No, dismissed. Neem, Agent Echo, stand fast. The room stood in unison and filed out, leaving me alone in the room with Jensen and Neem. I just remained seated. Naeem took the chair opposite me and we waited for Jensen to speak. Listen, hopefully this is something buggy with the dang software, but if for some reason it isn't, be careful. Dr. Lint has some seriously bad stuff down there she's messing with. The lady isn't exactly 100% stable. If things have gone bad, then your objective has changed. The Sam squad will be pulling out given certain criteria, specifically evacuation of personnel. But the meat of the job is on you guys. If Lint has lost her freaking mind, put a bullet in her head and destroy the station. Naeem quirked a brow. His voice was deep but lacked the rocky hits to that that Jensen's had. He was maybe six feet in height and well built, without being the bodybuilder type. His dark skin devoid of wrinkles but brown eyes full of experience. Any preferred method? Jensen shook his head. Echo here will tell you the best way to take out each experiment. This has to be a step-by-step -step job, as we can't risk anything getting free. Once each experiment is put down individually, then destroy the rest as you see fit. A Virginia-class sub will be on station to torpedo the place after you exit. I stuck my hand up. Who the heck said I knew anything about what was going on down here? Jensen turned to me. Your boss, I don't even know the specifics, but he said you would know when you saw them. The freaking thanks, brain. I sighed but nodded. All right, when we leave in. The 30 minutes after arrival on station, Jensen answered. Let's get some gear then, Agent Echo, Neem said, and we stood and walked out of the briefing room, leaving Jensen behind. Scientists, I hate scientists, 
especially government-related ones. Ones that experiment on stuff we never should have been dealing with in the first place. And create or discover monstrosities that start world-ending scenarios. People wonder why I'm so hateful sometimes. This is it. I followed Neem into the passageway and down a few ladders into the bowels of the ship. What we entered into was a large room that may have been a different purpose on a civilian PSV. But for the Lennox, it was an armory, packed full of squad-level firepower. It was a standard kit as far as squads went. M4 carbines, grenades, sidearms, one or two with shotguns. I myself grabbed something rather standard. A Mossberg 500 shotgun. I pushed shells into the bandolier sling, and then again into the tubular magazine, and secured a M17 9mm pistol. I slid a body armor vest over my head and waited once again. That's something that some of you may not realize. Teams aren't exactly constantly ready to battle. It takes a bit to get geared up, especially for something as sensitive as an underwater research facility. Unlike a normal building, a facility on the sea floor is under tremendous pressure. Any degradation of the structural integrity of the facility can destroy quite a bit. Thankfully, most of them have automatic systems that can seal off a compromised section. Just hope that you aren't in it when it happens. The PSV docked with the platform that served as the official cover for the facility below. Exploratory wells have been dug in the Atlantic. That much is a public knowledge, but very few people have the means to explore what came of them. As it sits, there are a couple of oil platforms in the Atlantic that most of the world doesn't know about simply because of how remote it is. This was one such platform. A derelict hunk that stood out against the gray sky, like some long forgotten giant whose carcass remained frozen in time. The teams were offloaded in stages. It was slow going because of the waves rocking the ship, but eventually, we all made it on board the platform itself and began the long climb up rusted and wet steps that groaned against the bolts affixing them to one of the gigantic legs that held the platform aloft. I turned and watched the PSV sail away from the platform, ostensibly to remain away from the platform in anger to weather the storm and await our findings. Upon reaching the platform proper, Sam and Eam led us up into even more steps to a small shed in the shadow of the central tower. The control room itself was a dingy affair situated at the heart of just about everything, but that wasn't exactly our destination. It would have been a bit of cliche to put the entrance to the lab in the control room, right beyond a big, clunky computer that was shaped to look like a desk. Instead. What we got was a big, clunky computer shaped like a desk, but in a maintenance shed. Unoriginality points for the US government. Naeem worked some magic on the dead terminal, and the entire thing shifted to the side, showing a white, brightly lit hallway beyond the terminal itself. We had to duck to enter, but once inside, everything was fine. My brow lowered, a confusion working its way across my face. The architecture was a beautifully strange, an octagonal hallway that stretched on and down to a landing. The crazy thing is that the hallway had no seams. Nothing that indicated where the ceiling and the wall met, nor the wall or the roof. It's as if the entire hall was one large section made of a material that deadened sound. Boots made a racket on hard floors and we were making none of it. The landing was similar like the hallway opened up into an octagonal room, maybe 10 meters square. Light flowed into the room, but from where I couldn't tell. No fixtures, bulbs, or even the distinct humming of fluorescent lights. Wall sockets and switches were absent, as were vents of any kind. Against the white wall were red letters that said, Airlock A. I ran my hand along the letters curiously again. No seams. Sam, the squad A leader from earlier, procured a pamphlet from a pocket that sat over his deltoid. He read it, and then placed his free hand over the A on the wall, and moved it over in small, steady increments. After moving about six feet away from the door, a square flashed underneath his hand, a soft green light that pulsed between exact periods of bright and dim. 
After a few seconds, a tall doorway seam appeared to his left, and without a sound, the door slid to the side and disappeared. Airlock A was open. With me, see y'all on the flip. His heavy accent broke the silence, but seemed deadened somehow. His point man moved forward, followed by the rest of them. Once they were all through, the door closed and the wall became seamless once again. That was weird. One of the operators spoke up. Neem, what the heck is this place? Another said. Neem shook his head. Some above my pay grade, boys and girls. Mayor Lock Bravo is down the hall. He motioned to the side. Another octagonal hallway descended deeper into the structure with another landing smaller than the current one. We moved forward and down at a steady but somewhat leisurely walking pace. The difference between this and the movie, while well, in a movie, they'd be checking corners, bounding forward from cover to cover, weapons raised and ready to go. Here, there wasn't any cover. No real corners to check, save for the small landing that turned to show another descending octagonal hallway. As a group, we remained evenly spaced in two staggered lines on each side of the hallway, weapons loaded but at the low ready. The usual banter accompanied the group. Although in hushed tones, there was talking and laughing, a bit of mirth before our entry into the facility itself. After what seemed like an endless number of descending hallways, we had reached the bottom landing. The same shape as the last large one. Red letters spelled out Airlock B on the wall on the far side. Naeem repeated the same motion that Sam had, pressing his hand in a specific, unmarked spot to open the door. We walked through, not really sure what to expect, but knowing that it should be a lab of some sort. Obvious, yeah, but what we got was not expected. The airlock door shut behind us, blending in again with the wall as it had on the other side. We were standing in another faceless room, maybe 10 by 5 meters. From nowhere, a voice chimed through, robotic and cold. Greetings, beginning decontamination process. Steam hissed from the newly opened vents in the walls. My brow crinkled in response, nose picking up the faint scent of something peculiar. God dang it, I spoke softly. Boss, what, uh... One of the men spoke up from the back just before he fell over. One by one we were dropped, unable to fight the airborne chemical making its way through our system, and soon unconsciousness took hold, and the world faded to black. I awoke in a crappy mood, well, more sour than my mood usually was. You know when you get forced to wake in the middle of a REM cycle and you feel groggy as heck? Well, that was me. I felt awful, tired, and knees weak, arms heavy. Wasn't quite at mom's spaghetti just yet, but I was close. My eyes opened without my permission, moisture blurring my vision and forcing me to blink rapidly to clear it. With a groan, I sat up and tried to take a stock of my surroundings. The room that I was in smelled like rotten eggs, crap, and water damage. Unlike the pristine entryway, the usual fixtures of a room were present. On the moldy ceiling hung fluorescent light fixtures, evenly spaced along the surface. Most of them were burnt out, but three of them had enough light left to make the room mostly visible, though very dim still. Against the back wall was a sink and toilet made of stainless steel, the kind that you would see in a psych ward. The toilet had no seat, the sink had just enough protrusion to turn the water on, with no sharp corners anywhere. A dilapidated metal desk sat on the left wall with some moldy files and binders atop it. Opposite this was a steel cabinet that was shut tight. The rest of the room was filled with beds, all bolted to the floor and in varying states of disrepair. I felt a pinch in my right arm and looked over to see an old butterfly needle sticking out of my arm, connected to old tubing that had gelled, questionable fluid within. I promptly pulled it free and rubbed the angry red injection site. In the room with me was Naeem and three of his guys. Naeem was sitting on the edge of his bed, rubbing his temple to take the drowsiness away. 
He was wearing his OCP uniform just like the others were, but something was different. I looked down at myself, noticing that my armor, vest, and weapons were gone, as were my cell phone badge and anything else. Same went for Naeem and his guys. The figures the worst would happen, he groaned, forcing himself to his feet. I did the same, holding the metal headboard to steady myself. Two of the others in Neem's squad began to stare as I walked over to what looked like a dingy screen sitting a foot away from a large steel door. The screen had a few cracks on the inside, pretty much unusable for the most part. I pulled at the door and it came free with a loud, ear-splitting shriek. The place was silent, dead. I pushed the door open as far as I could, until it made a thunk against the wall to the side. I stood there in shock, staring down at the floor. The room that we had come from was one of several like it. The chamber we were standing at was absolutely gargantuan, a circular mass with a single column in the middle and doors on every level. From our location to the opposite wall was an easy hundred meters, maybe more, and stretched vertically at least that high. Attached to the column was a large arm which had a grasping mechanism attached not unlike the ones used to grab shipping containers. Along the floor, which was about six feet below us, were bodies, hundreds of them, in varying states of decay and level of completeness. Some looked rather fresh, while others seemed to be one step away from a skeleton. Others were missing arms or legs, while even more still had legs and arms where they should not have been. I fought the urge to throw up, the smell was absolutely rancid and the sight that went along with it didn't help any. By Allah, what is going on here? Nahim appeared by my shoulder, but his other two men standing behind him disheveled, wary and honestly were terrified. Dr. Lint should have known she would have fallen off the deep end, I said almost in a daze. Wait, you know who's doing this? The squad mate from behind, Raphael, spoke out. Dugar's body remained silent. Nahim fixed me with a look. One of those, I'm not upset yet, but I'd be willing to slap you for info, kind of looks. I let out a small breath. Lint used to be the director of my agency, and had been for years until one day she had resigned to take another position. It was going to happen anyways, given that her direction for us was to try and navigate through the fabric of our reality and enter into another to find out where the heck a lot of the cryptids were coming from. Uh, fight them on their own home turf. What's so bad about that? Raphael piped up. Everything is bad about that. We only live and survive these encounters because eldritch beings use most of their power to make themselves known in the reality that we live in. Even then, they still mess with our minds, our bodies, and destroy our souls and emotions. And you think it's smart to hop out from behind the barrier and try to fight them mano y mano? Lady, I don't even know what an eldritch is. You mind explaining that one too? He responded. I let out an exasperated breath and began to climb down from the room itself using points along the wall as a footing. The things you don't want to see, kid. I'm leaving this. Do what you want. Naheem started after me. No, hold on, Echo. We have a mission to finish here. Secure the lab, neutralize the dock if necessary. That still hasn't changed. And I'm not about to let you just walk out of here because you got scared. I dropped to the ground and he dropped right after me, with Rafael and Dugar following along shortly after. I stepped up to him and got right in his face while well, given our height difference. It was probably more comical than it looked. As far as I'm concerned, this mission is screwed, Nahim. Remember the schematics of the lab. You think a room this freaking big can fit in an undersea lab? Lint is a freaking looney tune, which would be fine if she wasn't also a freaking genius. If we make it out of here alive, assume me or something, I really don't care. The only good thing we have to go on is that it seems like she lost control of a part of the facility. As if on cue, a steady set of beeping filled the massive room and continued for a few seconds. The facility shuddered, creaking under pressure while the lights flickered and dimmed dramatically. The room went black. Four clicks, and the sound of four doors opening at once went through the room. We waited, hesitating, 
frozen in place by the sound of what flash slapping together, like someone was dumping bodies into a landfill. Disgusting slurping sounds mixed with the crunch of bones that took its place. Multiple mouths eating in unison. Listen, I don't get completely terrified often. There isn't much that does it, honestly. This, though, was something else. The lights came up, and in the room with us were four absolute nightmares. They looked like gigantic caterpillars, mottled tan and black skin stretching across fat two bodies, splitting and bleeding in many places as they lumbered along. Hands sprouted from their bodies, all different colors and sizes, grasping and pulling the creatures along the floor. Human hair of different colors surrounded mouths that constantly bit, containing teeth that were cracked and bleeding under the pressure. As they passed close enough to a body, the mouse would take a bite. In the center was the main office, a mouth three times as large as the others. Multiple rows of flat, human-like teeth filled the abnormally wide opening like rings on a tree. It reached another body, and the hands grabbed it up, pulling and tearing the corpse limb from limb. The smaller mouse feasted on the appendages. While the mane bit down in even bits on the torso, blood and viscera spilling down it like a waterfall. The crunch that came from it each time it chewed on the torso will never leave my mind. Naeem, to his credit, pushed his nausea down. He got my attention pointing at it, and then at his own eyes, finishing with a negative hand gesture. Puzzled, it took him a time or two to get it through my thick skull. They had no eyes and a light bulb went off and I nodded in understanding. I pointed to a door at the far side with a blinking green light that turned red at random. He nodded and I started forward, picking my way around limbs and bodies so as to not trip. Naheem followed behind, with Dugar behind him and Rafael coming in last. No sound, no sound, not a peep, not a breath. I had to wind my way through the room to avoid the others. The flight mode of my psyche engaged, but pushed down just enough to not run for it. I didn't know how fast they were, but oh god, I wanted to run. Naheem seemed a full shade more pale as did Dugar and Rafael. Dugar specifically was in bad shape. He was more seasoned than Rafal, but some people just have natural bad constitutions, and Dugar was one of them. He hurled, spewed out of his mouth and out of the floor. I turned and Naeem turned and we stared at him in horror. There is a creature near us to the right and one to the left, and they both reacted instantly, with an ear-splitting shriek, like several humans howling in pain. The worms charged at him. He tried to run, he really did. They were so fast that his hands propelled them along at a ridiculous speed. The two creatures smashed together with a horrible amount of force, catching Dugar between them and crushing him like a grape. The force was so much that the spray covered me, Nahim and Rafal. Standing there so to mouth agape, I couldn't do anything. The two creatures separated with Dugar's body in between. The hands between them pulled him apart and the mouse feasted, and the creatures began sharing the torso like some sick, twisted lady in the Tramp remake. I turned and continued my slow walk while they ate him. After some time, we made it to the base of the steps and then turned to look for Rafal. He gingerly made his way up after another minute, and we traversed the steps with excruciating slowness. We paused, looking back. The creatures had continued their cleanup of the bodies, I opened the door and it groaned to the side. We darted in and shut it in time to hear the sound of a thousand hands against the other side. Now, I allowed myself to throw up, and Nahim and Rafael did the same, like our bodies were nice enough to let us get out of danger before I spilling it all. I leaned against the wall and slid down to rest, tension leaving my body and rendering me pretty tired. Rafael walked a few feet down the hall to the T-junction, the lab down the intersecting hallway, elevated to the living quarters down the other side. We heard a few buzzes, a couple of attempts at the door handle. Locked, he said frustrated. It's locked. We jumped up, startled. A smooth, accented tenor came from a small speaker puck in the ceiling. I lit to him, mouthing, Lind. 
the good doc continued. Agent Echo, surprised to see you again. What kind of BS are you up to, doc? Oh, the usual dimensional travel experimentation. You know, the whole mad scientist shtick. A chuckle from her end. Those bodies are part of your experimentation, too. Naeem called out. All experiments have losses. You realize we're gonna put a bullet in you, you freaking whack job. Rafal called out, fist clenched. A threat from a tin soldier, how cute. Shut up, Naeem spat. What is this, Alyssa? I asked evenly. I think I knew the answer. Project Stonewall and Project Canalis, my dear. If you remember it, that is. Jesus. Now let's dispense with the busy talk, kids. Canalis is going rather swimmingly except for the little hitch. After I sent over the living quarters, they came back rather upset. You seem to have a knack for understatement, Doc. What the heck does that mean? Living quarters. Wait, that was Sam's team. It was a good way to put it. By now, they're probably being used as decoration. Seal is a rather frightening place. Seal. The highlight to him. What she calls the dimension beyond ours. Then why the heck did you send them? Rafael screamed. Oh, research. I needed to see what would happen to a human mind that was unprotected by Stonewall. My initial expectations were that they would have gone mad. Obviously, I was correct. I'm not going to bother with any more questions, so here's the deal I'm offering you. I installed a manual decompression feature in the living quarters. Normally, it would be right across the hall, but when that section of the lab returned, things got a bit topsy-turvy. Two hallways down and two to the right, you'll find a security room. Inside is an idiot-proof panel that will allow me to decompress and destroy that section. Activate it, and I'll give you just enough time to get out. Deal? Well, you don't have a choice, really. The intercom clicked off, and the door to the living quarters unlocked, the red light turning green. Naeem grunted. Eh, friggin', I'd rather die of decompression than by one of those worm things. He walked over to the door and pulled the handle to the side. The door opened without a sound. An acrid scent of death hit us like a ton of bricks, bringing up a new wave of nausea. We pulled our shirts up over our noses and walked inside silently. The lights were on, but the halls were the same, dingy, rusted, and run down. The contrast between the entry hallway and the stuff inside was so strange. We passed through the hall and paused before a window. The scientists within were seated at lab tables, eating as if nothing had happened. Lab coats dirty, clothes ripped and bloody, but they were just eating. We moved on quietly two hallways down, turning right, and then moving two more hallways down. The security office looked out of place, like someone had done a makeshift install job in the entire section. We stepped inside and closed the door, and immediately threw up once more. Sam and his team were there. They were everywhere, in fact. Stripped, field dressed, and sectioned, they hung from makeshift hooks in the ceiling. Rafal finally lost it. He went over to the pile of rifles in the corner and began checking each one. Empty, empty, freaking empty. The rifles sat there without magazines or ammo. However, in the clothes and body armor were knives at least. We went over and procured what we could. Canteens of water which we quickly chugged. And a knife apiece except for a fowl. Carrying two. His maddened eyes had turned to eyes. Decompress this, I'll distract them. He ran out of the door without another word. Though Nahim yelled after him. I walked over to the panel and activated it, and then pulled a large, heavy switch downward to complete the process. Screaming and yelling could be heard outside. Stabbing noises, struggling. Rafal was trying. The intercom beeped again. What? Did you think there would be sirens and flashing lights? Get going, you have 60 seconds. Lint clicked off the intercom. We ran, sprinted, lungs burning. At the intersection was a mass of people focused on a falling Rafal. The poor kid had bite marks all over him, scratches and blood running down his body. He was wild and fueled by a maddening need for vengeance. We turned left and bolted. Wait, help me, please. 
He screamed as they dragged him down. With tears in my eyes, I kept running. Nahim gritted his teeth and we pushed through the door, only to slam it shut as soon as we could. A few moments later, a deep bellow shook the facility as the living quarters imploded. Lights dimmed and we were knocked off of our feet. Rafal or the crazed scientist wouldn't be feeling anything anymore. The door to the lab opened. White, clean, sterile, just the way Alyssa liked it. Gone with the dingy hallways, the creaking sounds, the smears on the walls, and the smells. The hallway leading to Alyssa Lint's lab was the same as the one we had first used when entering the facility. We walked to the end and the door opened for us, allowing us to step inside. Her lab was clean, neat, and tidy. Machines of various sizes littered the walls of the large room. A device with a platform stood along the back wall, almost like a gateway. The whir of machinery was almost soothing. God, what the heck? Nahim slapped his neck, looked, and staggered to the side a bit, and then fell to the ground unconscious. On the other side of him was the lady of the hour. She looked no older than the last time that I saw her, which was about six years ago. The knife in my hand dropped when I saw her pointing a pistol at me. In her other hand was a needle she had used to knock Nahim out. The doc was a slight woman, maybe a hair taller than me. She was one of those scientist types that wouldn't eat for days just so they wouldn't interrupt their own work. Certainly not in the greatest of shape, but then again she looked pretty good for a mid-fifties woman. Small, button nose sat between and below a sharp set of brown eyes that were so dark, one could be faulted for thinking that they were black. Black hair was pulled back into a tight, professional bun. Part Indian and part British, her genius was only matched by her overall instability. Seems like my tin soldier didn't make it. Oh well, this one will do. Consider it professional courtesy that it wasn't you I chose, Echo. Chosen for what, Doc? What is happening? Project Stonewall, my dear. Seal is not a place the human mind or body can traverse, so I have to make it stronger. Unfortunately, sending the leaving quarters tripped the emergency protocol. Oh well, it gave me a fresh subject. Step back, please, into that glass door there. Or what, you'll shoot me. Come on, dog. But then a bang of the gun. Searing out pain shot through my leg. The doctor had pulled the trigger and sent a 9mm slug into my thigh, dropping me to the ground with a scream of complete pain. I don't care how tough you think you are, getting shot freaking sucks. What the heck? Shut up, Echo. I told you that condescending attitude of yours will get you killed one day. A last chance, girl. Go. Pushing myself onto my butt, I scooted backwards, trailing blood on the floor until I entered the small circular glass tube that she had told me to. Looking to the side, I saw buttons. An elevator. I shot her a confused look. She hit a button and the glass slide closed. No do sex machina for you today, Echo. You lost your living quarters and you're on the bottom of the ocean. What the heck do you think you're going to do? No, you mean that submarine part outside my door. I have that under control. What? I laughed. Please enlighten me. I said as I tore a piece of my shirt off to stuff into the bullet hole. Oh, Echo. She took a tablet from the wall and crouched down in front of the partition and pressed it up against the glass for me to see. When did you ever think I wasn't in control? I stared, horrified. The living quarters appeared on screen in one corner, the body room in another, the room that we woke up in. The walls turned to white, moving, changing to mimic the inside of the lab, pristine and flawless. The disgusting caterpillar creatures looked at the screen and made their way back to their enclosures, and the scientists that had torn were fall apart. They stood calm, still alive, not decompressed. She had used us to stall for time and gain a test subject in return, one not tainted. The elevator that I was in moved upwards and all I could do was stare at the doctor until she went out of sight. The elevator gained speed, moving faster and faster until it hit the open water. An orange flotation device bloomed from the opaque top, slowly guiding me upwards. I looked down to the lab. It was fully intact. A light bloomed in the middle and grew bigger and bigger until it swallowed the lab, 
and to half of the submarine that was ready to evac and fire on it. After the light receded, the lab was gone along with half of the submarine. Crap.